So in this video, we're going to talk about seismic waves, and we're going to take a look at a graph in your reference table that has to do with seismic waves. So at this point, hopefully when you see the word seismic, you realize that it has something to do with earthquakes. And you know that when an earthquake happens, large amounts of energy are released. The energy travels in the form of seismic waves. On a seismograph, the seismic waves are recorded and we can see the spikes that are made on the machine. Let's take a look at an animation showing an earthquake and some of the seismic waves that are created. So you'll notice over here we have station A. So that is a seismograph that is somewhere on the earth. And when I hit play, an earthquake is going to happen. So there we go. So you'll notice three different color arrows. Those represent three kinds of seismic waves. The red and the blue arrows are called body waves because they travel within the Earth's body. The green arrow represents surface waves, which travel on the Earth's surface. Today, we're going to focus mainly on those body waves, on the blue waves and on the red waves. So if you look at a seismogram, that's the printout, You'll notice a couple of things. We start over here on the left side where it's pretty flat. And then all of a sudden we get our first spike. That first spike is the arrival of the P waves. Those are one of the body waves. Then the spikes get smaller again, and then they get higher. That second tall spike. So here is the first one. Here's the second one. That second tall spike is the arrival of the S waves the other kind of body waves. And then afterwards, we're going to see some really large spikes. Those are the surface waves. So let's talk about P waves and S waves. We'll start with P waves. The P in P wave stands for primary. These waves travel the fastest. So they are the first waves to reach a seismic station, to reach a seismograph. They are compression waves, which means as the energy travels, it moves in a back and forth motion. You can see on the slinky down here that it's showing the energy is traveling to the right. What happens with P waves is that as they go through material, they basically make the crust get squeezed and stretched, kind of like playing an accordion. So squeezed and stretched. P waves can travel through any kind of material. They can travel through solids, liquids, and gases. And that's actually very important because seismic waves tell us about the inside of the Earth. Let's take a look at an animation of a P wave traveling through an object. So on the left side over here, you'll notice that there's a picture of the Earth and there's a little blue dot. I'm going to send a P wave through that dot. Notice that the dot moves back and forth. And that's because P waves are compression waves. They squeeze and stretch. Now, S waves are different. I'm going to send an S wave through this blue dot over here. And you'll notice that S waves make materials move up and down. They're called shear waves. Shear means moving up and down and they cause more damage than P waves because the S waves are making the Earth move up and down. So the S waves stand for secondary. They travel slower than P waves. So they are the second ones to reach seismic stations. Again, they're called shear waves, which means the energy in them flows up and down. And another thing that's important about S waves is that they cannot travel through liquids. And that is very significant because they help us learn about the interior of the Earth. So again, P waves are primary, S waves are secondary. If we go back to that first animation, I'll make the earthquake happen. You'll notice that, watch that red arrow, that got there first, those were the P waves, and then the S waves got there afterwards. Same thing will happen here. The P waves get there first. There's our P wave spike. Then the S waves arrive. And finally, the surface waves arrive. 
So in your reference table on page 11 is a very important chart that you're going to get a lot of practice with over the next week or two. It's called the P wave and S wave travel time chart. Take out your reference table. We're going to annotate this a little bit and I'm going to walk you through how to use this chart at a very basic level. Let's start with the X axis. So on the left hand corner, we have zero and you'll see the numbers get bigger as we move to the right. These numbers represent the distance to the epicenter and the unit is 10 to the third kilometers. So 10 to the third scientific notation really stands for a thousand. So these numbers are actually in thousands. So this would be 1000 kilometers from the epicenter, 2000 kilometers from the epicenter and so on. Each small line represents a distance of 200 kilometers. The pen is a little thick there, so it's taking up a little bit more space than I'd like. But if this is 1,000, then the first little line is 1,200, 1,400, 1,600, 1,800, and 2,000. So again, the small lines represent 200 kilometers. On the y-axis, we have the travel time in minutes. So in other words, this will tell us how many minutes it takes for the P waves and S waves to travel a certain distance. Now these numbers are in one minute intervals, which means the small lines are counting in 20 second intervals. So if this bottom line represents four minutes, the line above it is 4 minutes and 20 seconds. The next line is 4 minutes and 40 seconds. And then the next line, obviously, is 5 minutes. So what can this chart tell us? Well, this chart can tell us a lot of useful things. So we're going to start off slow. We're going to start off simple. Let's say that we know a station is 7,000 kilometers from an epicenter. If we look at this chart, we can figure out how long it will take the P wave and the S wave to travel that distance. And all we do simply is to come to 7000 and come straight up to our P wave, which hits right over here. And now if we come across, we can see what the travel time is, which would be around 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Now an S wave is going to take longer because we know they travel slower. So if I come back to 7,000 kilometers and I go straight up to my S wave, it hits it right there. If we come over, we see it will take around 19 minutes for the S wave to travel 7,000 kilometers. You'll notice that if you go near the epicenter, the gap between the P wave and the S wave arrival is pretty small. As you get farther and farther away from the epicenter, there is a bigger lag time between the P wave and the S wave. And that's actually really useful information because if we know how far apart the P wave and S wave arrived, we can figure out how far away the epicenter was. So let's go through some practice problems. These are in your packet, your earthquake packet, on the bottom of page nine. We'll walk through these ones together. So question one, how long does it take a P wave to travel 2000 kilometers? So 2000 kilometers is the clue. So we're going to come to that number on the X axis and we're going to follow it up until it hits the P wave right over here. We're going to take it across and we can see that it will take four minutes and zero seconds for the P wave to travel 2000 kilometers. Second question, how long does it take an S wave to travel the same 2000 kilometers? Well, we know that S waves are slower, so it's going to take longer. So if we come back to 2000 kilometers and we go up to our S wave this time, it hits the S wave curve right over here. So if we come over, that is seven minutes and 20 seconds. 
So that's how long it takes the S wave to travel 2,000 kilometers. So that's one kind of question that we can answer by using this graph. Another kind of question that we could answer is we could figure out how far an S wave traveled in a certain amount of time. So let's say an earthquake happened 11 minutes ago, and we want to know how far an S wave traveled in the 11 minutes. So now we're going to start on the Y axis. We're going to come over to 11 minutes. We're going to come over until that line hits our S wave line right over there. And we're going to come straight down and that will tell us the distance that an S wave can travel. So that's going to be 3,300 kilometers. Again, my pen was a little thick, so it's not actually on that line. It's a little bit to the left of it. It's actually a little bit in between the 3,200 and the 3,400 line. So we go with the number in the middle. Now, how far can a P wave travel in the same 11 minutes? Well, we know P waves are faster, so they're going to get further. So if we come to 11 minutes, and we come over to our P wave this time, it hits it right over there. That time it looks like it's right on the line. So if I come down, it's going to be able to travel 7,600 kilometers. Question five, how long does it take a P wave to travel 6,000 kilometers? So 6,000 kilometers, that is our clue. So let's find that distance on the bottom. So here's 6,000 kilometers. Let's go up to the P wave. It hits it right over there. So if I come straight across, we have to make sure we go straight across. It will take around nine minutes and 30 seconds. Again, it's going to put you in between two of the lines. So each line is 20 seconds. So if we're in between them, we're going to estimate and go with 30 seconds or 50 or 10, whatever is appropriate. Last question. How far can an S wave travel in 9 minutes and 40 seconds? So we go over to 9 minutes and 40 seconds, which would be this line right over here. We go over to our S wave because that's what we're being asked for. And it hits it right over there. So if we come straight down, we can see that an S wave will travel approximately 2,800 kilometers in nine minutes and 40 seconds. So those are two of the basic uses of this, uses of this graph. We're going to be learning how to do other things with the graph in class tomorrow. But for tonight, I want you to practice. I want you to work on the top half of page 10 in your packet. Practice these skills. We'll go over them tomorrow and we'll take things one or two steps further.